I've been uh, really appreciating uh, this last number of months, kind of as I mentioned Sunday, and uh, kind of rekindling the fire of understanding end time prophecy. So much of the Word of God in the time that it was written was prophecy for another, uh, for another time. And since that, you know, since much of the Scripture has been recorded, those events took place, but in the time that the author was writing it, it was still future. I heard uh, one man say who teaches on prophecy that two-thirds of the Bible and the day that it was written was still future for that author. And that uh, there's a great volume of prophecy so much end time prophecy is in the scripture and it's given by the Holy Spirit as a motivation uh, to give us a bigger picture, to give us stability in the times that are coming. And I really believe that as a fellowship, we've been extremely weak on prophecy from the scripture. Now, we've been strong on, on prophecy, you know, the Bob Jones, Paul Cain, that kind of stuff. But we've been very, very weak on the biblical dimension of prophecy. And I've studied it several times in the last 15 years, several different cycles of, of time. And, uh, you know, for six or eight to 12 months at a time or four months or whatever. But I just feel really uh, rekindled. I've been feeling this for about a year and a half. I've mentioned it once or twice. A, a new desire to study in time prophecy. So in the, you know, in just the next couple of years, I'm sure I'm going to be hitting it a number of times because it's, my spirit has really been stirred for a while to get through uh, some of the things I've been doing to really give myself to this and I am just completely uh, uh, my spirit is just engrossed with this the clear precision of what God has already given us in the book for the things that are coming obviously there's many arenas that I don't have that kind of insight in but there's many many principles that have already been given us in the scripture and if we spend time gleaning them we can have insight as to what's going to be coming down in the days to come. In Matthew chapter 13, verse 24. Now in Matthew 13, Jesus is giving, is, is, has given seven parables of the kingdom. Seven parables of the kingdom. These parables are very important. Uh, when you first read them, if you don't know uh, what's going on, it seems like, well, huh, seems nice. Why are they so significant? What was going on is that Jesus was... Uh, uh, teaching the people in his day that the nature of the kingdom was going to be very, very different from how they anticipated it. If you study the Old, Old Testament alone, I believe that you find a strong understanding of the millennial kingdom. The millennial kingdom is in the scripture. It talks about a thousand year reign upon the earth when Jesus Christ will literally come down to the earth in person again and he will reign for a literal 1,000 years from Jerusalem over all the nations. And what's going to happen during that 1,000-year period is going to be the fulfillment of what was originally supposed to happen. Now, some theologians believe that that's figurative and a spiritual. And many, many theologians throughout history, of which I'm not a theologian, but I stand strong that this, this is a literal 1,000-year period, that Jesus is literally coming to the earth. He's literally reigning in Jerusalem. And the nations are literally going to obey him to the full degree. I believe that's really going to happen. Now, the majority of church history of the theologians have believed it just that way. It's called a premillennial point of view a pre, uh, in terms of uh, end time events. Well, when you read the Old Testament, the millennial kingdom, the thousand year literal reign of Jesus uh, stands out so strong that all the Jews were expecting this millennial kingdom to be the, to be the next thing on the prophetic timetable. They were not expecting a 2,000 year gap of the church age. They were expecting Israel to step right into the millennial kingdom when the king came. And Jesus came and they said, he's the king, praise God, we're gonna defeat the Roman Empire because the millennial king would come literally and defeat the Roman Empire. The problem that the Jews didn't understand is that there was gonna be a 2,000 year gap and the Roman Empire was going to be revived 2,000 years later, and the Lord was going to first come as a suffering servant. He was first coming to die on a cross. There was going to be a church age, and then he was coming to defeat all the nations, specifically the Roman Empire, which is going to be revived as a ten-nation confederacy in the last day before the Lord comes back and sets up his reign upon the earth. And so in, in Matthew chapter 13, what's going on here? is that Jesus is starting to give them the picture that it isn't going to be the millennial kingdom next. And that was real confusing to the Jews. 
He says, guys, he said, it's not what you're thinking. The Lord has a mysterious period called the church age, and it's going to first appear before the millennium appears. And uh, all the Jews were convinced that, like I said, the king was coming next. He said, because in the millennial kingdom, uh, disobedience is punished and done away with completely, or eventually it's completely done away with. The disobedience is not tolerated. The Jesus' laws are completely upheld in all of his commandments by the nations, politically, socially, and every other dimension. But he says there's going to be a period of time before that happens. Now we happen to know now it's 2,000 years. At the time then, they didn't know it was going to be 2,000 years. But if the Lord comes in the next generation, it's just a 2,000-year period there. He was saying where the kingdom of God is not going to be in its purest form. The kingdom of God is going to have wickedness and righteousness growing in it or, or under the banner of it at the same time. And the people were scratching their head. They said, we thought when the king appeared, all wickedness was going to be done away with. And Jesus was saying, well, not immediately, but eventually that's going to happen. That was real confusing to the Jewish people of his day. So Matthew chapter 13 is seven parables giving them the understanding that the kingdom was not going to come in its fullness immediately. This was a brand new doctrine in Jesus' day. And he gives seven parables that basically say the same truth in a different way every time. And the truth is this. Full obedience isn't coming and there's going to be mixture from now until the millennial kingdom starts. Full obedience is not appearing right now. There's going to be mixture, and I'm going to allow evil and wickedness to increase before I do away with it. That's basically the message of every one of those parables. And that was a brand new doctrinal point, because the Jews could not find that doctrinal point in the Old Testament. Now, obviously, it is in the Old Testament, but it's not very clear. So when you go to Matthew chapter 13... You read that seven times in the seven parables. They scratched their head and they said, what is he trying to say? And Jesus says, I'll tell it to you clear. Obedience is not going to be immediate. Universal obedience will not appear immediately. Wickedness will be allowed to, to increase. And there's going to be mixture from now until the next period of time. And uh, like I said, that was a very, very difficult uh, uh, piece of information for the Bible scholars of Jesus' day. Now to us, as most of us are Gentiles that didn't know anything about the millennial kingdom, and we read Matthew 13 and go, oh, pretty neat chapter, I guess. So what? We go to chapter 14. But it was really, really radical in the day that he was speaking it. And so it's important to know that. Verse 24, he presented another parable to them saying this, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. He says, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, Matthew says, and Mark, Luke, and John say the kingdom of God. It's the same thing. The kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven is the exact same thing. And there's a reason why Matthew said heaven instead of God, but it doesn't matter right now. But anyway, the kingdom of God will be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. So there's a man, there's seed, and there's a field. And, and there's obviously good seed. But while men were sleeping... The enemy came, his enemy came and sowed tares along with the wheat, and then the enemy went away. And so this field has wheat and tares in it at the same time. We're going to find out in a few minutes, the field is the world, okay? He's going to, Jesus is going to say that real clear to, you know, in, a, in a few verses later. Verse 26, but when the wheat sprang up and bore grain, then the tares became evident also. Now notice the timing that when the wheat sprang up, when the wheat began to come to maturity, they noticed the tares became evident, even more evident as time went on as well. So wheat and tares are growing together in the world and they're both becoming more evident and more mature as time goes on. I'll tell you ahead of time, the message Jesus is about to tell them is there's going to be a mature harvest of, of wickedness along with a mature harvest of righteousness. And that was the disturbing doctrine that they had no way of understanding that that was going to happen after Jesus came because they thought once Jesus came, all their troubles were over. Like I said, they didn't know about that 2,000-year period. So he, he's starting to tell them there's going to be a harvest of tares along with the harvest of wheat. He said that was a new theological point. Now the slaves of the landowner came and they said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? 
you know, the Lord's servants came and said, wait a second, we thought you did something good. Why is there wickedness still in the world if you came? Is, is basically what he's going to get at in a minute. That's ki kind of the bottom line interpretation of what's going on here. He said to them, an enemy has done this. And the slave said to him, do, do you want us then to go and gather up all the tares? You know, the uh, servants of the Lord said, I know what, we'll go get rid of all the tares right now. We'll burn them at the stake. We'll have, the, you know, the Salem witch trials. I mean, we'll get rid of all the false doctrines in all the world. We'll kill them. And Jesus says, no, no, don't, don't do that. That's not what I want you to do. And they're scratching their heads. says, I thought this was a kingdom of righteousness. He says, yes, wait, you'll understand. Verse 29, he answered him. He says, no, I don't want you to go gather them all up. I don't want you to get rid of them. No, lest while you're gathering up the tares, you root up the wheat along with it. He says, what you'll end up doing, you'll go burn one of those guys at the stake that have a false doctrine, and he was going to be born again. If he only waited a few more years, he would have been saved. He said, don't do it. Let it go just like it's going. He says in verse 30, allow both to grow together. Now, that's the key phrase. Jesus is speaking about the nature of his kingdom before his literal coming and setting up the millennial kingdom. He said, let them both grow together. And the point I'm, I'm making here, there's going to be a mature harvest of righteousness and a mature harvest of wickedness in the same generation at the same time in the earth. And it's the will of God that this thing comes to pass like this. He says, allow them both to grow together until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, see, there's a timing when the Lord sets up the ideal. He says, let it grow until, that's a timing word. He says there's a specific time appointed by the Father, and when that time comes, it's called the harvest, it's at the very end of the age when everything is done and the Lord gives, you know, comes to uh, take account of the earth. He says that's the time that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to set up the millennial kingdom as they were expecting it you know, at the time of Jesus' first coming. He says in verse 30, Allow them both to grow together until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest... I, here's the Lord, I will say to the reapers, the reapers are the angels, gather first the tares and bind them up in bundles to burn them up, but gather the wheat into my barn. So at the time of the harvest, Jesus is going to tell the angels, go gather the tares and burn them. There's going to be great judgment upon the tares. There's going to be great divine judgments on the earth as the Lord gathers the tares to burn them before they're even... Part of the burning is eternity, but part of it is the judgments of the book of Revelation. Okay, when he got through with this parable, the twelve were looking at each other saying, wow, that was profound, wasn't it? And the other guy said, yeah, that was. What does it mean? We don't have a clue. They had no frame of reference to be able to interpret that because all the theologians of their day had doctrine that was totally against this. Verse 36. <clears throat> Then he left the multitudes, he went to the house, and his disciples came to him and said, explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. He says, we, we're troubled by this. This tares part, there's not supposed to be any tares. If you're here, I mean, aren't, aren't you the king? And Jesus says, yes. Well, why, there, why is there going to be tares? I thought when you came, and like Jesus would have said, nope, there's going to be a 2,000-year period called the church age before that happens. And I'm sure he didn't say it just that way. I'm sure he kept part of it as a mystery to them. But, uh, when he appeared to them for 40 days after the resurrection, he spoke to them concerning the things of his kingdom. He must have explained some of those things to them at that time. They said, explain to us, verse 36, the parable of the tares. He answered and he said to them, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man. So Jesus is the one that sowed the good seed. The field is the world. It's the whole earth. The field isn't just the kingdom. It's the whole world. And as for the good seed, these are the sons of the kingdom. And the tares are the sons of the evil one. The tares are the sons of the evil one. The enemy has sowed them. The enemy who sowed these tares, the enemy that brought forth sons of unrighteousness, it's the devil himself that's done this. The harvest is the end of the age. The very end, the culmination, that is the day of the harvest, the very end of the age. The reapers are the angels. Therefore, just as the tares are gathered up and burned with fire, so shall it be at the end of the age. 
the Lord is going to send forth the angels and the sons of unrighteousness will be burned with fire. That's the whole book of Revelation right there. The Son of Man will send forth His angels. They will gather out of His kingdom all the stumbling blocks and those that commit lawlessness. And uh, they will cast them into a furnace of fire. And in that place there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. For he that has ears, let him hear. See, verse 43, the righteous shining forth like the sun was what they thought was the next thing on the agenda. They thought verse 43 was what's going to happen when Jesus was on the earth. They had no idea he was going to die. When he announced to them, he goes... He says, uh, you know, my uh, dear brothers, you don't understand. I'm going to die first, and there's going to be an age for 2,000 years. I, I'm sure he didn't tell them that time frame, but now, in his, you know, looking back, we know it's 2,000 years. He says where uh, uh, they're going to trample underfoot the blood of the covenant. There's going to be people who are going to mock what I've done, and it's not going to happen just the way that, that uh, they thought. Okay, so <clears throat> let's, let's read uh, verse... 25, 24 to, to, to 30 again. Let's read the, that verse again because now you've even got a few more of the symbols. Let's go ahead and read. The kingdom of God may be compared to a man. We know that's Jesus who sowed good seed in his field. That's the good seed that he sowed is converts, right? He's filled the earth with converts. But while men were sleeping, the devil came and sowed uh, true sons of unrighteousness. We're not talking about people that haven't been saved yet. We're talking about people who are never going to be saved also among the wheat and then they went away <clears throat> when the wheat sprang up when the church begins to mature when it bears its grain the tares are becoming evident too the the true sons of unrighteousness come to the same level of maturity as the sons of righteousness the sons of unrighteousness do the slaves of the landowner came and said to him sir did you not sow only good seed we thought that you only were bringing forth the righteous how is it that there's the unrighteous in great power because there's going to be a great false anointing on the unrighteous at the end. He said to them, an enemy has done this. The devil's done this. Do you want us then to go gather him up? <clears throat> Jesus says, no. Verse 29, don't gather him up. Uh, <clears throat> but, uh, because you're going to end up pulling up some of the true converts. Because like I said, some of the Lord's servants are still serving the devil right now. It says, and I believe it's 2 Peter 3, 9. 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is patient so as he gives time for people to come to repentance. That's why he's patient. He's very long-suffering. Think of some of us in this room right now. <clears throat> we were aggressively serving the devil. I mean, all of us were in blindness at one time, but some people were aggressively serving the devil. I mean, you were serving him even with understanding, some of you. And the Lord has allowed you to be brought into his kingdom. Praise the Lord that he didn't uh, let somebody go burn you up. Amen? <clears throat> I'm glad he didn't. I'm glad you're here. But anyway, verse 29 the Lord says, no, don't do that. Verse 30, allow them both to grow together until the harvest. Remember, the harvest is when? The end of the age. The time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, that's the angels, gather up the tares, bind them up in bundles, and burn them up. Verse 40, therefore, as the tares are gathered up and burned with fire, so shall it be at the end of the age. So shall it be at the end of the age. <clears throat> okay, so uh, we don't, you know, different people, I'll say it this way, people, different people in history have had understandings of the kingdom of God and what they wanted to do, they wanted to produce laws in society that made being an unbeliever illegal. There's different times in the history of Christendom where the saints wanted to make laws that commanded you to be a believer because that's in the millennial kingdom, you have to be a believer, you're in trouble. And uh, Matthew 13 tells us, no, don't do that. Now, I'm not talking about uh, not having laws, righteous laws in our society, but I mean the, 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 the law wasn't, you know, uh, you know, laws for morality. I'm talking about this, the law was if you're not a believer, you can't live in this nation. Or if you're not a believer, let's put you to death. I mean, there was literally extreme groups that have risen that violated the principles of Matthew 13. Others, like I said, uh, they went on the crusaders, they went wars, and they wanted to kill unbelievers to make them converts. You know, there's uh, different point of views of what Martin Luther did. He wanted the Jews to become converts. He tried to force them. You know, he read the Old Testament and said, Hey, man, if you worship a false god, put them to death. 
And you guys, you, you know, he didn't like the Jews and said, you're worshiping false gods, kill them, you know. And they didn't understand Matthew chapter 13. The Lord says, no, allow them both to go. I'm going to give you three tensions, three tensions, and then just touch a little bit on it. Uh, tonight I'm just getting your uh, appetite wet, not really going into in, any in-depth on any one subject. But I'm going to give you three tensions that sometimes are confusing to people as they look at end-time prophecy. Tension number one, tension number one is this. There's going to be a victorious church. There's going to be a victorious church with a literal second coming of the King Jesus. There's going to be a victorious church, and at the same time, there's going to be a harlot church with a literal Antichrist ruling it. So tension number one, at the same generation, the church is going to come to full victory, and Jesus is literally coming as the king to take the church to himself, or actually he's coming to the church. And at the very same time, in contrast, there's going to be a harlot church. The Bible teaches clearly of a one-world church at the end. That's kind of the phrase where, you know, we've heard for years, the, the, the one-world church, or, the, you know, some people call it, the, you know, the world council, they think that's the one. I don't think that's the one. I think it's going to be something a little more dynamic than that is. Some people say it's the Catholics. Some people say, no, it's the this is, and it's the ecumenical movement. It's this and that. I don't think the one world church has appeared. I believe the stage is being set at about 15 religions, and there's going to, some way, there's going to come a unity in all of them with a common denominator. They'll probably have Jesus' name sprinkled all through it. And uh, it's, it's very, very simplistic and not, I don't believe it's accurate to say the Catholics are that. I believe there are, there are Catholics that will be a part of that, just like there's Protestants, just like there's Satanists, just like there's all kinds of people in all the religions of the world that will make up that one world uh, church. Revelation chapter 17, Revelation 17 describes this one world church, this one world religion. It's going to be a very, very real and very powerful thing. And it's going to prevail for a season across the whole world. And I believe we're going to see charismatics. We're going to see uh, fundamentals, evangelicals. We're going to see Catholics. We're going to see Buddhists. We're going to see Hindus. We're going to see all types of backgrounds coming into this because there's going to be many false signs. There's going to be false anointings. There's going to be, there's going to be really, really obvious to the elect because they're going to, they're going to be standing against Jesus. Some people are so paranoid of being deceived. You know, I've been hitting on that in the last few months that we have more confidence in Satan to deceive us than Jesus to lead us. And some people are so afraid of the false they have no confidence in the true. I believe that a person that stays in the Word, that's teachable, that stays in the body, and that has an honest heart before the Lord is not, is not going to have any serious problem with deception. I don't believe the true believers... Are going to, I think if, if, if uh, believers get deceived, it's going to be the rare exception and not the rule. The true believers, it will be an exception and not the rule if, when, if some of them are deceived. Matthew 24 says it this way. If possible, some of the elect could be deceived. If possible, some of the elect may be deceived. You, you, you know how theologians quote it? Most likely, the majority are going to be deceived. It didn't say most likely, it said if possible. It didn't say the majority, it says if some, perhaps some, will be deceived. The majority of the born-again believers in the world that are sincere, that are in the body, that are in the Word and have a sincere heart before the Lord, are not going to be deceived by what's going on. It's going to be crystal clear. The thing that's going to shock us is a whole lot of people that sat in the pews didn't really care about Jesus Christ, and they're going to yield to the expediency of this false religion and this one world church so that's tension number one there's going to be a victorious church but there's also going to be a false church a harlot church revelation 17 and i don't really have time to develop the theology of a victorious church I've been sharing on it some and others have and some of you you know you have it clear from your background <clears throat> and there'll be times to really build that theology very very clearly i plan uh sometime, uh, I don't know when, you know, I got all these projects I got to do one of these days, but anyway, but uh, I have an, an urgency in my heart, I hope sometime in, in 1990, I'm supposed to have it done by the leadership conference in June, but anyway, to have uh, a booklet written on the, on just some simple theology of a victorious church. The reason is because many leaders in America today do not believe in a victorious church. They believe that the Lord is going to come and surprise us and rapture people, take them out, and there's going to be a little ragged remnant hanging on to the end, and we barely made it, and he came, and it was you know, a great escape 
claws. And whew, aren't you glad we didn't all fall away? And it's amazing how many people believe that today. And there's real need for just the real simple layout of the theology of a victorious church. And uh, some of you, I'm sure, have come from backgrounds where you were taught the Lord is going to come any minute. You're going to be raptured away. We are going to miss the whole thing. And uh, we're all, you know, filled with immaturity and sin everywhere. And yet he got us out in the nick of time. And I want to tell you, I do not believe that is biblical or not, neither is that sound doctrine. I do not believe there's going to be a secret rapture where we're all taken away instantaneously. I believe it's biblical that there is a rapture. No question. The Bible is very clear about the fact of a rapture, but the timing of it being any minute while the church is in this pathetic state is not a biblical truth. You do not find in the Bible where the rapture is going to come before the church is finished with its divine mandate. The rapture will come the church will be transformed in the twinkling of an eye into the supernatural, eternal, immortal state. But the Lord is coming for a mature church that's described in Ephesians 4.13. The Lord is not coming for a church of which the majority of them are backsliding or a month or two away from it if the Lord didn't come real quick and steal them from the power of the evil one. Let me say very clearly that there is a rapture, no question. It's very biblical. The fact of rapture is very biblical. The timing of it being any minute before the Lord is finished with His work, I do not believe is biblical. There's a number of things that have to happen before the Lord comes. And I'll say it very clearly because I know that uh, we'll all be here in, in the time to, in the years ahead, that it is not going to be maybe this year, maybe next year. That is, in my opinion, a distraction to the body of Christ that is not of the Lord. The Lord said in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 that the believers will know the times and seasons. You know, I, I've heard many times people say, well, you know, you don't ever really know the times and seasons. 1 Thessalonians 5 says the evil ones will don't know the times and seasons, but the believers do know the times and seasons. There are a number of signs in the Word of God before the Lord comes. Very, very clear. And they have to happen before He comes, and many of them have not happened yet. And the number one sign is a mature, victorious church above all the other. There's another, quite a few other ones as well. But uh, and I believe strongly the Lord isn't coming any day. The Lord is going to finish the task He started, and He's going to end it with victory and glory, and, he's, and He has no anxiety before the powers of darkness with His ability to finish the task He started. He is an excellent leader. And he's going to show it forth before all the ages and before all the powers and principalities, his ability to have a people that are totally his. That's tension number one. A real antichrist, a real harlot church, a real second coming and a real victorious church coming at the same time. Tension number two. <clears throat> There's going to be a great worldwide revival with astounding miracles. There's going to be a great end time worldwide harvest. I mean, a billion people coming into the kingdom with great miracles and at the same time there's going to be a great falling away with false miracles. There's going to be a great falling away with false miracles. That's the second tension. That while the real harvest is coming, there's at the same time a great falling away taking place the same time that the real harvest is expanding by hundreds of millions. Now you say, now wait a second. The Bible talks clearly about the great apostasy is what it calls it. Matter of fact, I'd like to turn you there. Uh, if you'd go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, the great apostasy. There is, on the prophetic uh, timetable ahead, a, an apostasy. An apostasy means the falling away from the faith. There is a time that Jesus spoke about, Paul spoke about it, the prophets spoke about it, where there will be a great falling away from the faith in terms of uh, uh, observable obedience to the faith. There's going to be a whole lot of people falling away. Now the place where I believe we've gotten to confusion is that this great number that falls away, we have mistaken it to mean the majority of Christendom is falling away. That's where theologians have taken it to step beyond. I believe there's going to be millions and millions that are going to be leaving true Orthodox Christianity. Millions. But there's going to be hundreds of millions joining. And I believe, I don't know if there's going to be tens of millions leaving. I don't know. But the tens, let's say there are tens of millions leaving. If there are tens of millions, it's those that have not established themselves truly before the Lord. I believe that the majority of those that fall away 
uh, are not even born again. They're in the churches, in the pews, and it's, it seems expedient to kind of hang around the ways of the Lord. But when the going gets tough, and when the pressure's turned on, they're going to say, you know what, I didn't really care about Jesus anyway. Not really. I don't know why I put 20 years in the church. I just did it to keep my wife happy. Those are the people that have not genuinely given themselves to the Lord, I believe is going to make up the major company of those that fall away. Right there. So the good thing is, instead of X percent, whatever the percent is, in any given church, you know, that of people that are not genuine, the church will be made up of genuine believers. Yes, millions are going to fall away and be exposed as non-genuine. Millions. But hundreds of millions are going to be added. There is a great falling away that's unparalleled in history. And it may pro very possibly be tens of millions. I mean, I, I, who, you know, I don't know the number. I just know it's a, lar it's a large number. And the Bible talks about it very clearly. I want to give you a couple of verses because I'm just giving you some little overviews here. Not, uh, like I said, any one doctrine am I really developing. But uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse uh, 3. It says, Let no one deceive you, for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first. The man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. Now what he's talking about here is there's an apostasy at the end of the age that must come, an apostasy of falling away, that must come at the end of the age. Okay, I'm going to give you a couple other verses. Matthew chapter 24, verse 10. Matthew 24, verse 10, and Matthew 24, verse 24. Jesus, the glorious captain of the host, talked about many will fall away. You know what we've, we, the commentators have done? Instead of the word many, they've put the word most. It doesn't say most, it says many. How many of you know that tens of millions is many? <laughs> That's a lot, but it's not most. It's very, very subtle shift. Is that uh, many, many, like I said, theological circles have the majority of the church backsliding and Jesus rescuing us at the end. And uh, it's a real fatalistic theology. Of course, I, I don't care if it's fatalistic or optimistic. I care if it's biblical or non-biblical. Now, one guy said, that can't be right. That's not positive. He said, well, I said, I don't care if it's positive or negative. I care if it's true is what I care about. And so, uh, but I'm just saying that this fatalistic theology just happens to be fatalistic and non-true. The Lord is going to finish His purposes. Now, what He's talking about here in 2 Thessalonians 2, He's talking about the coming of the Lord for the church. Look at verse 1. Now we request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of the Lord and our gathering together to Him. He's speaking about the catching up and the gathering together to the Lord in the clouds. Now, some people say, no, no, the rapture is one event, and then seven years later, there's the second coming. When you, uh, of course, you know, you don't have, a, those that believe that don't have a microphone, so it's not fair, but I believe it's very clear in Scripture, the terminology is synonymous to, uh, between the rapture and the second coming, that the second coming and the rapture are one and the same event. And he's talking about here, this passage in chapter uh, 2, verse 1 is the same language of 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, when it talks about we're caught up in the twinkling of the eye and we're brought together to be with the Lord. It's the same exact terminology. Uh, that, that, that most people use to describe the rapture as being second from the second coming. So, uh, chapter 2, verse 1 of 2 Thessalonians. Chapter 2, verse 1. He's talking about the second coming. He's talking about the gathering together are being gathered together to meet the Lord in the air is what he's talking about. He says, now, read it again, verse 1. We request you, brethren, with regard to the coming together of our Lord and our gathering together to Him, that you not be quickly shaken from your composure, that you don't be disturbed either by a spirit or a message, or a letter, as if it's from us, to the effect that the, that the day of the Lord has come. He says, matter of fact, he said, let no one deceive you about this issue. See, what was going on is that the church at Thessalonica was disturbed because a spirit, that would have been an angel, or a message, a prophetic revelation, or a letter from Paul to the effect the day of the Lord has come. Some people translate that the day of the Lord is very near. Some uh, translations actually translate it is very near, and some say, as the New American Standard, the day of the Lord actually has come in the past tense. Paul say, regardless what they say, it's not true. I don't care if a spirit told you that. I don't care if an angel appeared to you. It's not true. The day of the Lord has not come. Because see, what was happening is in chapter 3, verse 9, they, verse 6 to 10, they thought the day of the Lord was coming any day now, and they were abandoning their jobs, and they were going up to the mountaintops, living, waiting for the Lord to come. 
And Paul said in verse, chapter 3, verse 6, he goes, Now I command you, brethren, in the name of the Lord Jesus, you keep aloof from every brother that leads an unruly lifestyle, not according to the, to the traditions which you've received from us. For you yourselves know how, we, how you ought to follow our example. We didn't act in an undisciplined manner. We didn't eat anyone's bread without paying for it. We, with labor and hardship, were working night and day so we wouldn't be a burden to anyone. Not because we don't have a right for the, you know, because they had a right to the financial support, but in order to offer ourselves as a model. Verse 10, for even while we were with you, we gave you this order. If anyone doesn't work, don't let him eat. We hear that some among you are leading undisciplined lives, doing no work at all. But they're acting like busybodies. Such persons we command and exhort in the Lord, work in a quiet fashion, eat your own bread, but as for you, brother, do not grow weary in doing good. If anyone doesn't obey our instruction in this letter, take special note of that man. Do not associate with him that he'll be put to shame. There were the, these were the brothers who wouldn't go get a job. He said, well, man, the Lord's coming any time. I mean, hey, what, you know, let's wait this thing out. Paul says, you're disturbed. He said, that's not right. He says, chapter 2, verse 3. He says, don't let anyone deceive you about this, for it will not come until the apostasy comes. He goes, I'm not coming for my church until the apostasy comes, number one, which it hasn't come yet. And number two, some theologians would say it has through church history, but I believe there's a great falling away at the very end of the age that has not been manifest in a great way yet. He says, also the, son of law, the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. The Antichrist must be revealed before the Lord's coming. Until the Antichrist is revealed, as described in this chapter, I am not concerned about the Lord coming any day. Scripture says, don't let anyone deceive you. The apostasy first, the Antichrist second, the victorious church, and there's a, about, there's a handful of other signs as well. So until those signs take place, I know that we have time before the coming, the catching up of the Lord to meet the Lord in the air. Verse 4, it says, this son of destruction is the one who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or every object of worship. This is what the Antichrist does eventually. He takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. I realize there's the spirit of the Antichrist in the world, and it's been working in the world from the beginning, since Adam and Eve. The spirit of Antichrist has been working for 6,000 years. But there's going to be a literal man that's coming. He's called the man of lawlessness in verse 3. He's called the son of destruction. He will oppose and exalt himself above every so-called God and every type of worship. He will be, set himself up as the supreme object of worship. He will take his seat in the temple of God. That's where people uh, uh, get that the temple has to be restored. Obviously, the Lord's not interested in anybody offering sacrifices to him in that temple because those sacrifices are meaningless to God because he's already offered his son. But uh, in Israel, I believe there will be a temple restored. I don't believe it's a temple that is the Lord wants sacrifices from, but I believe, I don't understand the full reason why that's going to happen, but I believe it, there is going to be a temple that's going to be restored, and this evil man will walk into that temple and display himself as being God. He will say, I'm the true God of this temple and every type of worship. He says in verse 5, do you not remember that while I was with you, I was telling you these things? And you know what restrains him now so that in his time he may be revealed? For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains him will do so until he's taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth. The Lord will bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. That is the one, the person whose coming is in accord with the activity of Satan. With all power, signs, false wonders, with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. Let me ask you a question. Who is this deception for? This deception is for those who perish. This is not the deception that's going to uproot the church of the Lord Jesus. The deception of this, of this evil leader is for those who perish who don't love the truth. I ask you a question. Do you love the truth? Or some, some people are so, you know, unstable about it. They go, I don't know. I hope I do. I mean, I mean they're so introspective. They, they could never answer it straightly. And uh, I would say that the vast majority in this room, you do love the, tr you do love the truth. The Antichrist is not going to be deceiving those that love the truth, those that love Jesus Christ. 
But he is going to deceive those who perish, those who don't love the truth. For this reason, God will actually send upon them a deluding influence so they may believe what is false in order that all may be judged who did not believe the truth but took pleasure in wickedness. That's really quite a heavy thing going on. The Lord is going to, re, he's going to remove, he's going to draw the line and he's going to remove all the gray area. The Lord is going to be working in his church in a dynamic way. Hundreds of millions are going to be coming into his church. I mean, there's going to be a great revival. At the, uh, Matthew 24, 14, there will be a witness in power to all nations. And then the end, there's a Holy Ghost witness to the nations in power beyond anything in the book of Acts that's in store coming down from heaven and that's what's going to be going on simultaneous to to this I mean in that same time frames these things are going to be taking place there's going to be a great revival the Lord is going to draw the line a lot of people well they don't want to really go with Jesus but they don't want to really want to go with the devil either I mean who wants to go with the devil you know they don't like Jesus but they don't like the devil you know they maybe try a third option the Lord says no no it's not going to be that way at the end of the age he said I'm going to draw a clear line and I'm going to offer my son with apostolic power to the nations. And everybody will see the splendor and the glory of the power of the Lord. And those that do not love the truth and those that take pleasure in wickedness and say no, the Lord says, I'm going to get them off the fence. If they won't say yes to my son, I'm going to deceive them. I'm going to release a deluding influence where they say yes to, to the evil one. The whole world will be divided in two camps. Right now, there's hundreds of camps. There will only be two camps in the end. Those that love the truth and love Jesus Christ, those who do not love the truth, and the Lord will see to it, they come fully into, into alliance with that one world church, that one world religion. The Lord himself is going to send a deluding influence if they will not say yes to his son, so they're cooperating with the evil one. So his judgments are crystal clear on what's going on. That's pretty heavy stuff, isn't it? Turn uh, up a book to uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Just one book over. Verse 1. But the Spirit explicitly says that in the latter times some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. The Spirit explicitly said to Paul, I wonder what Paul experienced to write it that way. I mean, you know, you've had a prophecy before, you've had a vision. Paul said, no, this was no little prophecy, this is no little vision. The Spirit explicitly told me. I mean, I wonder what happens when the Spirit explicitly tells you something. I mean, you know, that must have been quite an uh, experience in the Holy Spirit when the Lord gave it to him that strong. I remember talking to Paul Cain once, and he said, the Lord ardently said I said ardently he said ardently I said how does the Lord say something and then say it ardently he says when the Lord says it ardently you know it's ardent. I go, oh never mind I'm getting too close and I said okay I'll just let that one go for now and uh, uh, anyway the spirit explicitly told this Paul this old Paul anyway some will fall away in the last times this was so important that Jesus, the great prophet, Matthew 24, 10, yea, more than a great prophet, the eternal God himself, Jesus in Matthew 24, 10 said it, and Paul said it here as well. He said there will be falling away, but it says some. It didn't say the majority. It says some of them will. I believe Jesus said many. Paul said some. I believe that the some, like I said, could be tens of millions, and it is many, but it's not the majority, and that's the confusion that I think that a lot of people have had, they've seen this great apostasy and they assumed it was the majority of all the saints. He says, no, that's not true at all. There's going to be a false uh, falling away for two or three reasons. Number one, there's going to be false anointing, false miracles with these evil men. False anointing, false miracles. I'm going to give you a couple verses about the false miracles. Revelation 13, verse 13 and 14. Revelation 13, verse 13 and 14. This is just a little overview. There's a lot more than, than, than just the few I'm giving you tonight on these subjects. Matthew 24, 24. Matthew 24, 24. And 2 Thessalonians 2, 8. 2 Thessalonians 2, 8. So that's Revelation 13, 13 and 14. Matthew 24, 24. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 8. That's, those are verses that say that these, 
the uh, false prophet, the, the Antichrist, and some others as well will have uh, false miracles working on their side. That's one reason there's going to be a great falling away. Another reason is that the Lord is going to send a deluding influence. The Lord Himself is going to send the deluding influence. The third reason, there's going to be persecution against the true church. And uh, there was a fourth one. All right, let me see. False miracles, persecution. Anyway, forget the fourth one. Wasn't that important. But uh, let's move on to, to, the, to the last point, tension number three. Tension number one, there's a victorious church and there's a harlot church. Tension number two, there's a great worldwide revival with great miracles, which I haven't had a chance to develop. But I mean, the miracles of the saints are going to be awesome. And in the Word of God, it's like I shared one recently in some of the congregations in Micah 7, verse 15. It says, the miracles that were done in the land of Egypt are going to be reported, I mean, repeated again in the last days. We're talking about the miracles of the caliber of of Exodus chapter 7 to Exodus chapter 14. The miracles of the blood of rivers turning to blood, the commandment of the prophets of the Lord, God's power is, in my understanding, is going to far exceed even Satan's power. It's going to be awesome. And so uh, there's going to be such a revival of the supernatural in the church. Acts 2.19 says this, that in the last days, uh, fire, blood, and vapor of smoke will appear at the command of the prophets. In that day, it says, the spirit of prophecy will cover the earth. There will be great signs and there will be great wonders in the sky and on the earth. Blood, fire, and smoke. The prophets of God will speak and the blood will come again like it did in Moses' day. We find out in Revelation chapter 11, verse 3 and 4. Revelation 11, verse 3 and 4. The two witnesses, which I really believe, I mean, there's, there's literal two witnesses and I believe there's a figurative understanding of who the two witnesses are and the corporate purpose of God. But they're going to have signs and wonders that are staggering. Revelation chapter 11. Those are God's servants. And so the uh, false uh, prophet of the Antichrist are going to have a run for their money. Well, not really. They're going to lose in a big way in the end. There's going to be millions coming to the Lord. A hundred, I mean, I believe at least one billion people. Of course, you know, there's five billion people in the world right now. So there's billions who won't. And there's at least a billion that will. It's going to be a great end time uh, uh, a harvest. Okay, the third tension that I want to end with is this. God's judgment on the rebellious is going to be going on at the same time that Satan's wrath against the church. God's judgment on the rebellious will be going on at the same time that Satan's wrath will be against the church. And Except for God's judgment will be significantly more severe against the rebellious than the wrath of the devil against the church. The book of Revelation, get this clear, the book of Revelation is mostly about God's anger against rebellious men. It's only a little bit about Satan's wrath against the church. People read the book of Revelation and say, I don't want to be there when that happens. Go, wait, there's only about three paragraphs against us. I mean, there's chapters against them. What do you mean you don't want to be here when that happens? You've read the book wrong. It's the righteous judgment of a holy God against the nations that have rejected the great apostolic witness of power to the nations. First, the Lord's going to release a great end-time visitation of miracles. A billion are going to come into the kingdom. You know what a billion is? That's a thousand million. You know, a billion is, is one-fifth of the world's population right now. Do you know what a billion people looks like? A billion people means 20% of the entire earth. That means in a city like Kansas City of 1.5 million people, that's 300,000 converts coming in at a great harvest in a city like this. 300,000 converts. How many, somebody real quick, four times three, 12. That's 12 churches, that's 12 churches of 25,000 members being birthed like that of all new converts in Kansas City alone. Now, obviously, it won't be an equal distribution, you know, like 19.9%. Well, you got a few more converts for that city. And it's not going to be equally distributed, but just to get the feel of it. You go to St. Louis with 3 million people, that's 600,000 new converts in a city the size of St. Louis. That's 12 times 2. That's 24 churches. 24 churches of 25,000 people birthed like that. That's what the Lord's going to be doing. 
And we're talking about massive numbers, and that's the proportion of every single city in the earth that size. I mean, the stadiums are going to be filled and overflowing. That's why we got to have the Chiefs win that game so they can put that roof on our church. And so, uh, and I was talking to some people, and they said, oh, Getting all psyched about football. I said, no, I don't, want the, I don't want the people to pay for that building. I mean, I don't mind, you know, getting out of debt, you know, a million bucks. That's $22 million. I said, we want the city to pay for it. We got to win the championship or they won't do it. And uh, <clears throat> when we go into that church, I don't mean we as KCF. I mean we as the saints in the city with all the others. We want the, you know, the roof on it and the bathroom's working when we get there for a change. <laughs> Amen. But I tell you, Arrowhead Stadium I mean, in front of three, four hundred thousand believers, I mean, you can only get a hundred thousand people if you have to put, pe put people on the, ch on the floor, you know, on the ground down there. That's a real small number. That's not very big. I mean, the, 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 uh, the buildings available are small numbers compared to the harvest. And like I said, St. Louis, that'd be six hundred thousand people in that city coming in like that. I and mean, we've got to get the gravity of what's going to be happening. The Lord told Paul Cain that the 90s, as the angel of the Lord spoke to him, it says the 1990s is the beginning of the mega church beyond understanding. I said, wow. I said, what? He said the mega churches begin. They haven't started yet. He says those little five and 10,000 member things are nothing. That, that, those are going to be not even thought of as big churches. The mega churches beyond understanding are going to begin in the 90s in this nation and the nations of the world. Like, you know, we all know about what's going on in Seoul, Korea. That church of 500,000. Paul said, that's a mega church. And the mega churches are going to be springing up all over the nations. He says, we, we haven't seen anything yet. Anyway, I got to stay with the final tension here. There, The book of Revelation, the book of Revelation is mostly, in terms of the bad stuff, is our Father dealing with the people who don't like us. That's what's going on. Obviously, they've rejected Jesus. But what I mean is, it's the enemies of righteousness that, 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 that are getting the bad end of the deal. It's not the righteous. I mean, certainly, the, the, uh, the devil has a wrath against the church, but it is nothing like the great judge of all the earth holding the nations accountable for rejecting Jesus with signs and wonders being manifest in front of their eyes. You read chapter 15, chapter 16, chapter 17, chapter 18. I mean, there's a nation. I mean, the nations are in serious trouble. When the Lord visits and brings this 600,000 here and 300,000 there, do you think he's going to sit back and say, well, you know, the others didn't really appreciate my son? No, there is going to be a terrifying judgment to the nations because they said no in the face of supernatural miracles beyond anything we've seen in history, beyond what Moses saw. And so uh, that's what it's going to be looking like. In terms of that, so that's the three tensions, the wheat and the tares growing in maturity together at the end of the age, and then the Lord dealing with each of them according to His Word. Amen. Let's stand.